a true prophet was in their midst. Uh, this is a chapter in the book God dictated to me, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. Ezekiel is a prophet whose name means God strengthens. He is of the son of Buzi and a priestly descent. That means he's of the tribe of the Levites. He is taken away with King Jehoiakim Je at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's second attack on Jerusalem. Jerusalem was defeated and deported in uh, two different attacks, as I understand it. This is Ezekiel chapter 33, pages 32, uh, verses 30 through 33, with commentary by Rashi, uh, which I attained at Shabbat.org on the internet. Verse 30, And you, son of man, the members of your people who talk about you beside the walls and in the entrances of the houses, and one talks to the other, one to his brother, saying, Come now and listen to what the word is that is coming forth from before the Lord. And this is this is how Rashi interprets that. Who talk about you. His commentary, who mock you. In a sense, I can kind of read that and say, it doesn't sound like they're really saying mock, but they're talking to each other and to the brothers, and this is who they're talking about, and I guess is where it comes from. And, and of course, uh, there could be some translation problems in the English. But this is where it becomes real clear here in 31 that this is, this is uh, teachings to uh, Ezekiel. While he's going to, you know, he, this is occurring in Jerusalem before he's taken away in a second attack because he goes through the fire refinery at his house uh, near Jerusalem. He's not inside Jerusalem. Uh, because he's, he's, he's forced to lay on his side facing Jerusalem and, and to prophesy against them, to tell them, you know, y'all are sinning too much, this and that, you need to repent, you need to stop, uh, because you're all going to get uh, uh, defeated and taken away if you don't. That's God's wrath on you. <clears throat> um, but as I said, during this, this five refinement of, of punishment, chastisement, bruising, crushing, wounding, uh, maltreatment, which to me is the biggest one. It, it's really, it, it's tough to be maltreated by God, and it really hurts your feelings. But, um, and, and I've had so many accidents and surgeries and injuries. I, if, I'll take physical pain over emotional pain any day of the week. But in any event, uh, you know, he, no matter what he's doing to me, he's teaching me. Or he's changing my personality, and he's coating my emotions in his power, uh, where, where they're dulled, so to speak. They're not what they, you know, I used to get angry, it'd flare up, and, and I'd stay angry for days. And now it's just so different. I can get angry still, and, but it, 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 it's, it's not, it, it, it used to be like it was just raw anger, and now it doesn't feel like that. It's totally different. It's very interesting. <clears throat> Verse 31, and they will come to you as a public gathering, and they will sit before you as my people. See, he's telling them, this is what's going to happen when you're there. And they will hear your words, but not fulfill them. Instead, they make them into jokes with their mouth. Their heart goes after their gain. I didn't include Rosh's commentary on this one. Uh, that wasn't that good. I mean, he just kind of repeated what I just said. Verse 32. And you are to them as a song on the flute, which has a beautiful voice and plays well. They will hear your words, but will not fulfill them. And of course, this is God speaking. Rashi's commentary. Uh, again, he's just kind of repeating what was just said. Verse 33, and when it comes, behold, it is coming, and they will know that a prophet was in their midst. Rosh's commentary, the evil to them, and when it comes, the evil to them, 
Behold, it is coming, commentary. For indeed it is ready to come, then they will know that your words were not a jest, but that a true prophet was in their midst. That would have been Nebuchadnezzar coming, Babylon. This is Ezekiel. Well, I want to point out that there seems to be some conflict in the understanding in, in some of this, and I can straighten it out. Some of these verses by Ezekiel apply to the Assyrian Babylons. Some of them, and most of them, and the important ones that I'm going to be noting, apply to the Roman dispersal that has returned. And some of them apply to both. They can both you know, what's being said could apply to the exiles and to the dispersal. Thus said the Lord God. This is Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 10 through 13. Thus said the Lord God. I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. The shepherds shall not tend themselves anymore. For I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and it shall not be their prey. Now remember, this is being written in antiquity. I mean, like that last uh, sentence. I will rescue my flock, this and that, and it shall not be their prey. So all rabbis today are praying on, well, that's not true. But what is true is they're to dismiss. Because this does not apply to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. It can only apply... It can only apply to the Roman dispersal. For thus said the Lord God, here I am. I'm going to take thought for my flock and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when some in his flock have gotten separated, so I will seek out my flock. I will take them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them to their own land. And I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, by the water courses and in all the settled portions of the land. Okay, that sounds like he's talking to the, the exiles. And possibly the dispersal at the same time, but he's not. Why? The northern kingdom was inhabited by Gentiles. The, the settled portion would, would be not the wilderness. Uh, he, so this is a time in Israel when, when the entirety of the lands, what was once Judah and what was once Israel, uh, except for what the Palestinians had taken over in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, uh, bloom again, and everybody's returned. And there are Israelis, uh, both in what was the kingdom of Israel uh, and in Judah. So that's applying to the dispersal. And what else? David's there. And he didn't appear. He does not appear when the exiles return. So that doesn't apply to them. It applies to today. See, a time is coming. Day of the Lord. The man of Isaiah 53 described, who is the descendant of David from chapter 11. That's God's representation. That's the person who tells the people, God says, Keith, tell them this. You know, just as he said, Moses, go tell the Israelites this. Go tell them this. Go tell them the book of Leviticus. Go tell them this and that. He's got to have a person. And we've got one description. Four men coming. Elijah, prophet like Moses. David. That's what God calls him. The son of David. He didn't call him son of David. He just calls him a servant David. And of course the righteous servant himself. All four righteous servants, a description of one righteous servant who can handle the chores and the task that any of them would have to do. And I'll mention that in a minute. This is Ezekiel 34, <clears throat> verses 23 through 30. Then I will appoint, so he has this reckoning and dismissal. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. So the entirety of these, yeah, these two, I mean, it applies clearly to the Roman dispersal. It cannot apply to the exiles. 
There is no account of the descendant of David returning with the exiles. That, that comes up in Zechariah too. Supposedly the branch was going to come and build the second temple. Well, the branch never shows up. And, and it's, it's clear that the branch is supposedly the name of Isaiah 11, descendant of David, from the way they talk about it. And he never shows up. So, and that doesn't make these people a false prophet necessarily. If God tells you to write something down, you write it down. He's got reasons for it. He's always got to read. He's got, to He's got three reasons and sometimes four every time he has a sentence written. It's not all prophecy by any stretch. He shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. The Lord will be their God, and my servant David shall be a ruler among them. Not over them, among them. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will grant them a covenant of friendship. I will banish vicious beasts from their land, and they shall live secure in the wasteland. They shall even sleep in the woodland. I will make these in the environs of my hill a blessing. I will send down the rain in its season, rain that brings blessing. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. That's today. The land blooms again. You basically get the same thing in Jeremiah 31. See the time is coming. My people shall continue secure on its own soil. Well, the exiles did not continue secure on their soil. So he says, this is, this is, you're not going to be defeated again as long as you pay attention to my prophet. There's things that have to be done to, to secure that. So this doesn't apply to the exiles either. Because Rome defeated them. They shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yokes and rescue them from those who enslave them. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations, and the beasts of the earth shall not devour them. Of course, you have the Holocaust after that, too. They shall, shall establish for them a plant, planting of renown. They shall no more be carried off by famine, and they shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. They shall know that I am the Lord their God and with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. Hopefully this ends up as, what is the purpose that might prosper, God? Well, I'm sending Elijah to clear the way for me. And he's telling you, in, in this covenant of friendship that's coming up, I'm going to place my, my temple amongst you eternally. You'll never be uprooted again. That's in Jeremiah 31 also. The purpose is build my temple. Build the temple. It's going to make a difference in whether you're ever attacked again or not. It's just, it's just going to tell the world, especially when, when, when the Jewish people start lifting me up based on all this knowledge God has given me. Oh, I know today I'm shunned and despised, held of no account, and because everything I say is so different. But everything I say fits together so well. It's, it's, you know, it's the evidence of who I am. And it starts out with, Rabbis, you dismiss. So, you know, <laughs> it sounds like a tough road to hoe, but uh, then again, they don't go to heaven if they don't listen to me. So... You know, they're just going to say, well, I don't believe he's dated. I haven't been dismissed. And I don't even know what that means. And I'll tell them to watch these videos. Okay, this is commentary from that chat. Oh, this is a blog writing which we put into the book. I'm not sure if this is exactly from the book. This is actual blog writing of which the book is put together with. The verses from Ezekiel 33 show the reality of his audience. They did not believe that he was, that he was a prophet. 
This is a good example of the prophet saying that the destruction of Jerusalem would happen because the people would not stop their sinful ways, and it happens because God's prophet is not recognized or heeded. God had already foretold through Isaiah that Jerusalem would fall and all of Israel would be deported from the promised lands and that God would banish the lines of the kings of Judah from ever ruling over Israel again by raising up a twig from the stump of the felled ancestral tree of Jesse, the felled and banished line of Jesus, who could not fulfill Isaiah 11.2, of the Moshiach, the anointed one, and who, being unblemished, could not be the sinful, sorrowful, and suffering man crushed with disease of Isaiah 53, known as the leper scholar in the Babylon town. The Christians, of course, say he is Moshiach, son of David, and that he is God's righteous servant. I mean, he claimed to be the man of Isaiah 53. This day, this prophecy is fulfilled, he said. Uh, but anyway, God knew they would not listen to his prophet. We just went through that in those verses. Ezekiel's purpose did not prosper. And God knew his purpose would not prosper long before the days of Ezekiel. God said to Ezekiel, And when it comes, behold, it is coming. And they will know that a prophet was in their midst. And Rashi commented, And when it comes, the evil to them, behold, it is coming, for indeed it is ready to come. Then they will know that your words were not a jest, but that a true prophet was in their midst. And Jerusalem fell, and the rest of Judah was deported. In Ezekiel 34, God says, Oh, I just read this. Uh, this is dealing with the shepherds of the man of reckoning and dismissing them. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. Of course, that did not happen. That is for the Roman exiles and dispersal of the Jewish people throughout the world when Elijah returns with the angel of the covenant, a sin forgiveness. For God's gracious return to Jerusalem in the day of the Lord. It makes sense. See, the time is coming. I mean, we're going to get a whole lot of things straightened out. And I'm going to get my temple rebuilt. And I'm going to make sure nothing happens to my people again. I'm glad they came home. That's basically what he's saying. Y'all finally came back after 2,000 years of desolation. Yeah, I'm coming back. That's all it is. Y'all come back, I'll come back. He wants to be with you. He wants to live amongst them. There are reasons he likes his presence to be on this planet. And particularly with his people. Particularly with his people. There's reason, I mean, beyond uh, uh, doing it for the Jewish people, I mean, for him himself, he, the entity that he is. You know, he doesn't have eyes. He knows and sees everything as though almost in a vision. In other words, he has absolute knowledge of all things. The wind blowing, leaves moving, grass, this, that. Uh, an absolute knowledge of me that he can see me clearer than I can see me in a mirror. It's better than eyeballs. Uh, and of course, he said me in so many visions I, I could I no longer can count them. Um, and, and they are amazing and uh, great clarity. It's, it's a lot lot better than a dream. But uh, he has a reason to be down here. Uh, so. And I mentioned Elijah returning with the covenant. Again, Elijah is taken to heaven, then he's returned. And what is that? It, it's two things. One, you would expect him to be able to talk to the angel who has the covenant. Which is, there's only two covenants, friendship and sin forgiveness of Jeremiah. Uh, it has to be Jeremiah. So it, it's the angel of the, of the new covenant is what it is. And uh, you would expect Elijah having been in heaven for thousands of years, to be able to talk to him. So there's a little symbolism there, or figure of speech. All will be forgiven between God and his wife, his bride, his children of the Jewish people, the Jewish people. They will be friends again. And that just means y'all came back home. 
It's kind of like the dad who's been sitting out on the porch just waiting. When they gonna come on? I know we fuss with each other. <laughs> and when they come back in, they're gonna be good. Can't wait. The covenant of friendship and sin forgiveness in a time to come is when Jerusalem has been rebuilt. And it says in Jeremiah, they will never be uprooted or defeated again. So again, these things can't apply to the exiles. And that's why it's so important that the righteous servant Elijah, the righteous God's righteous servant Elijah, God's righteous servant David, God's righteous servant prophet like Moses, and the God's righteous servant described, and I feel every single verse, God orchestrated my life to make sure I did. Wounded, sorrow, suffering, familiar with disease, crushed with the disease, exposed to death, but getting on line. I feel them all. I feel them all. And who can believe it? We have heard the witnesses should be saying just about everything I talk about. Who can believe it? And that will be the many madrasas. Those who want to get on board and start spreading the news. God is here and realize. Why weren't you looking for Elijah? Why do you think David's building the temple? It never says that. It says Elijah clears the way. You get it? I think he got a little Christianity ideology mixed up in there somewhere with with uh, Elijah clearing the way for Jesus. It's not what it's about. Uh, that would be John the Baptist, who was not Elijah, by the way. This is um, this goes back to what I was just talking about from um, Ezekiel, as far as the coming of friendship, where the land will bloom again. Uh, this is from Jeremiah. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with seeds of men and seeds of cattle. And just as I was watchful over them to uproot and pull down, to overthrow and to destroy, and to bring disaster, so I will be watchful over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. You know, you just about can't find anything in Judaism on the internet that I, I didn't find any decent articles or anything about this utter destruction that strikes the land if the purpose of Elijah does not, does not, if he doesn't get done what he's supposed to get done. Which looks to be we counsel the families one to the other, a purpose that might prosper, and that comes from Isaiah 53. That's, how the, that, that's the connection between uh, Elijah and Isaiah 53. It's the purpose, you know, because that would make the many righteous also. But uh, the big thing is clearing the way. Clearing the word. And that's what's happened. The land blooms again. This is when the Jewish people return to the promised land and make it bloom again. God says in Jeremiah 31 38 that the time to come is when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. And the measuring line shall go straight out to the Gareth Hill and then turn Goa toward Goa and the entire valley of the corpses and ashes and all the fields as far as the Wadi Kidron and the corner of the horse gate on the east shall be holy to the Lord. They shall never be uprooted or overthrown. And basically, you know, it's just, it's just about impossible to actually find the, all these boundaries. You can find the river Kidron, this and that. But basically it is Jerusalem be larger than it was in antiquity, or at least as large, and they far surpass that today. So it's today, you know. It's laid in ruins since uh, Rome destroyed it until 1948. Mark Twain went there in the late 1800s and said just that. It's a desolation. At <clears throat> uh, and, and, and that's another reason. None of this stuff uh, happened with this supposedly Elijah or, or Jesus and this and that. You know, God was in his temple. He didn't have to have a covenant of friendship. 
you know, he's, he's already there. He's not returning suddenly. Uh, Elijah, you know, once he comes, they're never to be uprooted and overthrown again. It can't be John the Baptist. All that, you know, I've got plenty on the book of lies and deceit. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's the, it's the most deceitful book ever written, and it started character of Jesus Christ is the biggest liar and deceiver that has ever lived on the face of this planet based on his own words, and the number of people deceived, billions. There's two billion right now that are deceived. That's just right now. He's talking about over 2,000 years. So I say that I say that boldly, and I want somebody to find me a bigger liar. I'll ride this ass into Jerusalem, and as all the prophets say of me, the Gentiles, She'll spit on me, spit me, scourge me, kill me, and on the third day I shall rise. You know what it really says? One prophet. First of all, that's never said. The Gentiles will it's never said. You can't find it anywhere. Inside the Bible, outside the Bible, and things that one can I cannot find. It's not there. But you can find Messiah riding an ass into Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 9. And we shall ride this ass into Jerusalem. And there he shall defeat the enemy and make all the countries of Brown surrender and bow down. These aren't the exact words, but you get the point. He doesn't ride in to get killed. He rides in to defeat and destroy the enemy and become king of the lands from ocean to sea. He changed it. Those are words straight from his mouth. Now, you find something more deceitful than that. that. I mean, all of Christianity is based on it. The prophet said it. The Hebrew Bible is prophetic of Jesus coming. No, you took it and you changed it. You stole the book of the children. And in chapter 51, which comes right before my description, chapter 52, which leads into 53, he passes his wrath to Christianity. Those who told you to get down and walked all over you. I see we pass it to, and I'm bringing it to them, and Jews, you can help. Raise me up high. You start talking, saying, you tell me this isn't him. You read these books. You watch these things. You tell me that's not him. He can't know these things. He cannot know them. It's not possible. God has to be telling him. That's, that's, that's the biggest stick God's got. But we got more. Isaiah 53. The man's a Gentile. He comes from a dawn. And of the Jews, none are with him. Adam, uh, it means Gentiles. And Adam was a Gentile land. And, uh, yeah, he's not a Jew. He's not a Jew, y'all. He's a Gentile. Can't be Jesus. Jesus is a Jew. For instance, doesn't come from the stump of Jesse. They may not even know what that means. Well, you know, we only have one ancestral tree of, uh, of peoples who had a Kabyan kids, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was chopped down. That's where the stump is. Well, and, uh, and then the shoot grew out of it through Solomon. It's got to be through Solomon, by the way, because he also got a covenant with God on kingship for his line. You want me? The time to come in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, when God declares he will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the covenant he made with them out of Egypt, which they broke, but he made them anyway. A new covenant for when they return to him in the lands of Abraham. And why a new covenant? They have been separated for 2,000 plus before they return, though not divorced, and he has waited to return, their return to him for 2,000 years. The covenant never ended. The new covenant is an amendment. We find that in Malachi when he says, be mindful of the laws I gave Moses that order. He changed it from strict compliance by all people to be mindful by those who heed and revere his name. That's the change. It's just an amendment. And he just keeps re repeating, I'm your, I'm your God, you're I 
I'm your guy and you're my people. So, uh, this is what he says. See, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, though I espoused them, married. Uh, anyway. But such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my teaching into their inmost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Then I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer will they need to teach one another and say to one another, Heed the Lord. For all of them, from the least of them to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord. For because... I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. Okay, first of all, writing toward your hearts a metaphor. What does it mean? And how is it that the forgiveness of sins of all the Jewish people is going to cause that to happen? Because it wouldn't. And there's too many Jewish people who aren't religious. It, it wouldn't happen. And he makes it clear in Malachi, I know there's plenty of people who don't uh, heed, fear, and re uh, revere my name. And that's why he's making a scroll of remembrance. And that's with the covenant at hand to be delivered. So this is just, you know, it's written. You can't take it literally. Uh, I mean, it's going to happen. But, you know, God says, if, if I ask, I'm forgiving all my people, then this is what I expect. You know, everybody's going to heal me. And, and it's going to bring everybody to observant Judaism which means if everybody's studying and working and going to synagogue, they don't need to, uh, they become very learned and don't have to ask each other questions. That's all that's about. You know, you got the amendment and now you got sin forgiveness. And the same sin forgiveness the exiles got, they became a holy seed, built the second temple. What are we doing today? Why am I here? To clear the way. To bring the wrath to Christianity, uh, reckoning and dismissal. To the rabbis. That's, you know, I'm the reckoning in the wrath. That's, you know, I'm God's tool for that. God's instrument. A fire band pulled from the fire. That's it, uh, <laughs> a man in divine veins. God says that his forgiving their inequities and remembering their sins no more will accomplish this putting of his teaching into their inmost being and inscribing from their hearts. But one has to understand God and his scripture of the Hebrew Bible from his perspective and the manner in which it was written to know what this means. Mind you, he dictated that to me. Write this down, Keith. Keith, get your computer. Okay, go ahead. You copy that. Uh, now, write this. Uh, type this. Because I had just said this, but it was in the way I talk and think. But this is how, you, reading the books is better than the videos by far. But with the videos of these chapters, you get to know me better and my personality. If God does not use his power to change the knowledge and hearts of the Jewish people in his teachings, and towards him the forgiveness of sins alone will not accomplish this. The Jewish people and all the different ways of interpreting the Torah by different branches of Judaism are too diverse and opinionated. Rarely is there an accord and meeting of the minds by the sages of the Talmud, the rabbis today, and the people in general. God has never changed the will of men and placed knowledge into their minds except for the prophets and his righteous servant. He's changed my will. He took it from me. He now owns it. And he has placed knowledge in my mind. Into their minds or changed their emotions and feelings towards him in his power. He spent 40 years in the desert with Moses and the Israelites, changing the minds and hearts of the Hebrews with his teachings he gave to Moses at Oren. And here we're dealing with the same teachings. An amendment. And he became their God and they became his people at Or Sinai, just like the covenant to cut be made in a time to come.
Okay, picking back up, this is from a, a different chapter in the book, God Dictated to Me, Isaiah 53, in the Day of the Lord, on the same topic. It's called the Sign of the Prophet. From the Rambam's Jewish Practices and Rituals, the laws of the basic principles of the Torah, chapter 10, 1. And this is in the quotes. We tell them to predict the future because he is a prophet, which he does. And we wait to see if what he says happens or not. Even if it was wrong in only a small matter, he is a false prophet. But if all of what he said comes true, then he is believed. From chapter 10, 5, also in quotes. If a prophet says about another prophet that he is indeed a prophet, then he is assumed to be a prophet. And the prophet who said it does not have to be cross-examined. The righteous servant of God of Isaiah 53, which is myself, is a prophet who serves God with devotion to his purpose. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy of Isaiah by his description. Because the man of Isaiah 53, he's anointed and attached to make the many righteous and uh, for God's purpose that might prosper. He is a prophet. He is not a prophet who predicts the future like a seer. He is a servant, just like Moses and Joshua and like Elijah and Elisha. A prophet is somebody who's been anointed by God and speaks to God and, and is assigned tasks by God. That's a prophet. Uh, nobody can see the future. It's just uh, that's something believed in antiquity. Um, so anyway, uh, Isaiah vouches for God's righteous servant by describing him. The unnamed man who fulfills all the verses is a prophet of God and all the people are to believe in him without cross-examination. In other words, just fitting the verses says who I am. And yet God has given me a mountain of evidence. These two books and all this knowledge I had to put together the day of the Lord and to explain why this Messianic era taught by Judaism is just nothing but foolishness and an absurdity and it strays completely from the ways of God. I mean, do you really think God is going to come down and change the minds of a racist, all racists and bigots and anti-Semites in the world? Do you think? He's been working on me for 13 years uh, to change me to what he wants. Uh, this is not something he, in his creation, that's not something that can be done. As he says, if I wanted human beings where I could do that, they wouldn't be the human beings that you know. We'd be a different type of individual, a different type of living entity with emotions. Okay? So while God can do anything, it has to be within the plans he has. Uh, for instance, in this creation, it would have to be a different creation. And he never did anything like that in the Bible. There's, you know, he could have made all the people love the Jews from the beginning, but that's not what he's looking for. It also, you know, in Isaiah, towards the end, God, what are you doing? I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. Huh. Well, the name Israel shall endure. Because they go through war and they have to show their love and devotion and reverence for God through such adversity that it's incredible. He's not going to change this earth and he wants the last Jew living on this planet before it's gone. And he has to make another one to have gone to the same strife. Everybody, everybody formed to be the person he wants in heaven. What is the new heaven? 
It's the Jews. They become angels. It's a new host of angels. The angels, Israel. That's what he's doing. And it's not going to change it. Okay, this is from uh, chapter 10, 5. It is fit for bidding to doubt or debate the prophecy of a prophet who has been found to be right time and time again, or the prophecy of a prophet who has been vouched for by another prophet. And it is also forbidden to test him excessively or forever. For one who tests him is like one who tests God. Do, for it is written, Do not test the Lord your God as you tested him in Massa. When we said, Is the Lord amongst us or not? Is that question being asked today? Is he really here? Once it has become known that he is a prophet, they will believe and know that God is amongst them. Why is that? Because he's with the prophet. That's why he's the prophet. Spirit lit upon him, entered him, and God is in the spirit. A man of divine beings, a host of the Lord's host. And they will nor debate or doubt his words in accordance with what is written. Yet they shall know that there has been a prophet amongst them. God's purpose with his righteous servant does not include the prophecy of future events. Matter of fact, they won't tell me anything of the future. If I can't know something of my own, I don't get to know. I don't know when I'll ever get, when I will get to Israel. You know, I don't know when the right people are going to hear these tapes, read those books, and recognize me and become the witnesses who, who, who will want to show their devotion and reverence for God by asking the question, who can believe what we heard? Who can believe our report? Upon whom has the arm of God been revealed? That's Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. He is a teacher of righteousness in the day of the Lord, as Elijah who recounsels families of the Jewish people, one to the other, together to Judaism, being mindful of the laws God gave Moses at or the amendment. He writes the words of God at God's command and direction as the prophet like Moses. And as the anointed one, God calls my seventh day that he brings the covenant of friendship and will be involved with securing the temple mount for the third temple or other lands in Jerusalem. It's kind of a long take, but it's worth listening to. Uh, I don't ever expect anybody to <laughs> listen to this whole, these tapes that are an hour and longer. Um, but um, but listen to all of them if you're not going to read the books. Now, the books always have more. And as I said, you get a lot of how I think and speak, uh, even though I am reading from these chapters from the books. But uh, there's more in there. There's more information. It's, it's easier to study it maybe than just listening to me talk. But I, I thank you for your assistance and time. And uh, I'm looking for those witnesses. And I got, if I'm going to get God to Israel, if I'm going to get him there for you, Israeli Jews, because he can't come without me. I had to get these books published, which would take about a year. And... Uh, and then I got to wait on to have enough royalties where I feel secure enough that I can go and uh, start a living, a uh, living being God's righteous servant. You know, speeches, dinners, seminars, synagogue uh, uh, preaching. 
everything will be centered around what God wants me to be doing. And as I said, he had me terminate my law licenses in the second year. I haven't had anything for, well, basically 13 years. And uh, it, which does not bother me at all. You know, uh, I've gotten to stay and live with my parents and take help take care of them. And they're, you know, my dad's 93, my mother 85 or 86. So this being uh, as tough as this fire refinement is, and I can't stress that enough. Um, there's been so much, so many great things that have already happened. Man. And to listen to the Holy Spirit, He says, "You have no idea how lucky you are." <laughs> well, we'll see. Anyway, thank you uh, for your time.